As you've probably gathered by now, my grandma's told me a lot of stories over the years about all sorts of creatures from all over the country, but only one of them took place in the small town where I grew up. In fact, I sort of even overlapped with the story when I was much younger and still lived in that small town in Prince George's County, Maryland, where our story takes place. And telling it to you, it's sort of a homecoming for me. I've been ruminating on it for the last 40 some odd years because this one really scared me. And the things that scare you as a kid, well, they kind of stick with you, even when you escape out to Hollywood. At the heart of this tale is a creature who, over the years, has been known by many different names, but most famously by two simple syllables, Goatman. Here's how I first heard it. As a younger woman, Grandma used to buy milk and cheese from a gentleman down the way called Mr. Wilson. He was a goat farmer and apparently one of the kindest, gentlest men she'd ever met. Mr. Wilson had a smile for everyone who visited his farm and kept the happiest, best-fed animals she'd ever seen. He also happened to be the only black man in town. Grandma said Mr. Wilson mostly kept to himself. He had no wife or children and spent most of his time at the farm, save for Sunday afternoons when he'd walk down the winding country roads into town with milk, cheese, and whatever else he had to sell that week. People would come out to buy produce as he walked by, but otherwise they mostly left him alone. But gradually that changed. Mr. Wilson started showing up on Sundays with less and less produce to sell, looking tired and without a trace of the big smile he usually wore. It was only after what came next that Grandma figured out what was really going on. See, some of the folks in town had begun to turn on Wilson. They thought he was stuck up and resented the idea of a black man making money off of them. That resentment led to bitterness, which led to hate, which led to a massacre. Not of people, at least not yet. It began with Mr. Wilson's goats. Week after week, one by one, the paddocks of Wilson's farm turned from lush green to red. As his precious animals, the only thing he had in his life, were slaughtered in the night. And then, when there were no more goats left to slaughter, they came from Mr. Wilson himself. A mob of boys from the local high school and their fathers dragged Mr. Wilson out of his bed one night threw him in the back of a pickup and drove him to the Kootenai County Bridge. They stripped him down and hanged him off the side and left him there to die. Horrifying stuff, and yet there's still more to it, more than my grandma had told me, that I only found out later when I was in high school because this is when I happened to kind of intersect with everything. Two of my classmates happened to brush up against this story firsthand, and from that incident, I discovered the part my grandma had left out of her telling. The part about how, although that night decades earlier was the end of the goat farmer's life, it was also the beginning of something else. Something that was still with us. Something inexplicably horrific. And very, very deadly. You're listening to Run Fool. I'm Rodney Barnes. And this is episode nine, Goat Man. Kootenai County Bridge is a relatively short bridge, about 100 feet of concrete and steel linking the east side of my hometown, where most of the houses are, to the schools and stores on the west. It's changed a lot over the years from the rickety wooden thing in Mr. Wilson's time through to the most recent upgrade when the town installed huge sodium lamps overhead to keep the bridge bathed in bright light around the clock. That was a smart move. One that had been implemented earlier could have saved at least three lives that I know of. But then, we wouldn't have our story now, would we? Anyway, don't go trying to guess my age or nothing, but this was about 40 years ago. In the muggy heat of high summer, and it started with some poor deceased canine lying rotting in the middle of the bridge. Now, a dead dog on the road is nothing new, but this was no ordinary hit and run. It was notable for two reasons. One, this dog had been mauled, maimed. It was, in fact, missing its head. And two, the head had been seemingly removed in a single snap, the gaping wound at the end of the neck, almost guillotine-like in its clean precision. 
The motorist who stumbled upon this wretched sight was Mr. Whitman, while driving his twin sons, Skip and Jack, home from football practice one evening. As Whitman turned onto Old Kootenai County, the mall corpse in the middle lit up suddenly in his high beams. Even from inside a car, it was clear that this was something extra messed up. Whitman got out to inspect it. Skip and Jack did too. I grew up with those twins and it's fair to say they were a little strange, but they were also tall and athletic. And in that town, at that time, that was enough to make you cool and popular, regardless of any inclination to stare at roadkill for fun. I'll admit, I even admired them. They were free spirits, they were funny, and they knew exactly how great they were, which was about the only thing I didn't like about them. But back to the dead dog, back to the bridge, where Skip, Jack, and their daddy were staring at the carcass in silence until Jack asked the only logical question, what the hell did this? The twins turned to their dad expecting a straightforward answer, even an, I don't know, would have sufficed. But unlike his boys, Mr. Whitman hadn't gotten out of his car for fun. This was about more than a gander at a dog's innards. He was studying it nervously, and there was an unmistakable tremor in his voice when he replied, well, not so much replied as muttered to himself, he's back. Skip and Jack waited for their dad to continue, but he just wandered back to the idling truck and sat there till the twins got in. Of course, they peppered him with more questions about what he'd meant. I mean, who wouldn't? A comment practically screams for a follow-up. But Mr. Whitman wouldn't talk no matter how much they pressed, save for ordering the twins to take the long route to and from school from now on. By which he meant, no more Kootenai County Bridge. Skip and Jack eventually let it lie. And again, carefree spirits that they were, they soon dropped any sense of horror and turned their attention toward more practical matters. Namely, how they could put that gnarly dog carcass to good use. Look, it was a different time. We didn't have all your fancy... Uh, forget it. Anyway, that same week, Skip and Jack were confronting something that they found much more horrific than a decapitated dog. A threat to their status as proverbial kings of the school. And that threat went by the name of Petey Howell. Petey had just moved to the area. And... Everyone loved him. Kids, teachers, the coach. The Whitmans brushed it off the first couple of weeks. Easy enough since they were starting lineup and Petey was just a sub after all. Till one day, they strode out into the parking lot, heading for the spot where most of our class gathered after the final bell, where the twins usually held court. And standing there, leaning against a nifty old clunker of a BMW, was Petey making everyone around him shit their pants with laughter. No one even looked up as the Whitmans approached, Petey included. And that was too much for Skip and Jack. They were pissed that this guy dared stand in this parking lot and entertain their classmates was one thing, but that he wouldn't even acknowledge them. Them. Skip's anger in that moment, plus the dead dog, combined into a sort of light bulb moment. And when he told his brother about it on the ride home, Jack confirmed it was genius. So the next day at school, Skip and Jack switched tactics. They started buttering up Petey, palling around and all that, complimenting his car, always the way to a teenage boy's heart. Then told Petey they wanted to hang out that night and that they'd pick him up around nine. Look, Petey had moved towns a few times, so he knew that when you're the new guy and people like the Whitmans want you to hang, you say yes even if you don't want to. The other kids seemed to like him, but the Whitman twins were the key to true acceptance. So he said yes, and later that night, Skip and Jack picked him up in their daddy's truck, barred without permission, of course. But the thing their dad would have especially been mad about wasn't the truck. It was the fact that after the boys collected their classmate, they made straight for the Kootenai County Bridge against his direct orders. Petey already wasn't feeling great about the situation, and that feeling obviously got worse when the boys turned their headlights off upon approach to the bridge. Skip could see Petey stiffening up and tried to put him at ease by explaining that this was a pre-game tradition, that this bridge was like a wishing fountain. You close your eyes and think about winning as you walk across to the other side. Skip said he swore by it, 
and considering the boys were undefeated this season, he seemingly had a compelling argument. You want to try, Skip asked. Petey did not want to try, because frankly, he smelled a rat. But Petey also wanted Skip and Jack to like him, or at least to not hate him, which is how he came to be on the bridge, walking blindfolded towards the darkness on the other side, dutifully wishing for a win in that weekend's game, but also wishing he'd pass whatever test he was being put through, and that after this, they'd all be buddies. Skip Whitman was calling out directions, supposedly keeping Petey in a straight line, a little to the left, a little more. Step by step, Petey was angling his body per Skip's instructions, until suddenly he was hit with a smell like rancid raw meat. He took another step, and then he heard the flies, dozens of them buzzing away in front of him. Well, that was it for Petey, and just as he was clearing his throat to tell them that, just as his hand started up to release the blindfold, he felt two hands push against his back, hard, and Petey fell. He readied himself for a collision with the hard concrete of the bridge, but instead, his hands plunged into something cold, rotten, and slimy. It was, of course, the massacred dog guts. His blindfold had fallen off in the tumble and he saw it inches from his face and all over him. And he knew instantly why the twins had shut off their lights, so that he wouldn't see this grotesque corpse he'd fallen inside of and get wise to their prank. Bile shot up in his throat and he frantically crawled away from the thing to puke his guts out. He could hear footsteps run back to the truck, laughter, and the devastating screech of the tires as the Whitmans peeled out and vanished down the road. Petey sat there feeling, well, hurt. He should have known better, but right then he needed a shower more than he needed anything in his entire life. So he blinked away the tears and told himself to get moving. He started heading back across the bridge when he heard a sound, like something else walking too, behind him maybe. He turned around to check, but there was no one there. He kept walking and there it was again. In fact, with every step he took, he heard another step almost immediately after, almost copying it, or more like a clomp than a step. And then he realized it wasn't coming from behind. It was coming from under the bridge, reverberating off the rocks below. And it was as though his movements were being mirrored by something walking upside down on the underside of the bridge. Petey stopped again, peering into the long shadows. Only this time, when he started up again, he tiptoed over to the railing. And this time, there was no clomping. Once at the railing, he leaned over the edge trying to get a glimpse of whatever was down there, but all he saw were the rocks below. Probably just his own echo, he thought. He started breathing a sigh of relief, but his lungs weren't even empty when a quick burst of clumps rang out, much faster and louder than before. And the last thing Petey saw was the glint of horns emerging from the darkness beneath the bridge and plunging straight into his throat. Skip and Jack laughed the whole ride home. Their joy, however, was short-lived. They'd assumed Petey would turn up at school, pissed as hell, but put in his place. But he wasn't in first period. Or second. And when an announcement came over the PA asking for any information about Petey's whereabouts the previous night, they knew they were in a world of trouble. Petey was probably lost in the damn woods near the bridge, too green to know his way home. And when he finally got home, he was surely going to bring down the hammer of justice on the Whitmans. There was still no sign of Petey at practice after school, so that night the twins took their dad's truck again, without permission, again, and made their way back to the scene of the, not crime exactly, prank. Yeah, that's all this was. When you put it that way, it seemed plausible that they could maybe do some damage control if they found Petey. You know, pilfer some beers from their dad's fridge and pass it all off as a hazing ritual. They knew, of course, that he still wouldn't be at the bridge after so long, but it was the obvious place to start their search. It was also where their search that night would end, because pulling up next to the dead dog, Jack noticed something off to the side by the railing. Their headlights were reflecting in it. 
It was a dark puddle, a deep red puddle, and leading away from it, toward the opposite railing and then disappearing, were a set of crimson footprints. No, not footprints, hoof prints. The Whitman twins shared a look, neither of them wanting to voice the unbidden thought that had just popped into their heads those two syllables that their father had uttered while standing over that torn apart pup. He's back. And considering the dog, a missing classmate, blood on the road, and those hoof prints, they needed some answers. And they sure weren't going to get those from their dad. So the next morning, they skipped school and headed to the local library. When you wanted to know something about this town, you asked Mr. Evers, the town's librarian. His dedication to this fine slice of Maryland bordered on obsession but those kinder than me would call it passion. Thing was, he was a hard hang, a grumpy, surly kind of guy who didn't want to be bothered during his shift at the library. So it wasn't surprising that when Skip and Jack wanted in asking about the Kootenai County Bridge, Mr. Evers' first reaction was telling them to get lost. What was surprising, though, was his second reaction. He looked up from his book, stared at the boys, and uttered, You don't want to go sniffing out the goat man. The goat man, Jack asked. Sure, said Mr. Evers. You don't know about that? Old goat farmer. Killed on that bridge decades ago. Skip couldn't believe it. He was even chuckling. This thing that their dad and the librarian were seemingly scared of was a goat farmer. This caused Mr. Evers to snap. He was a goat farmer, Evers said, slamming his book shut. Now he's something else. And if you don't drop it, your last moments on this earth are liable to be amongst the worst, most depraved, most violent you could ever imagine. That's how the goat man will be sure you meet your maker. When you get a warning like that, there's not a whole lot you can do with it other than let it sink in, which the twins did. They stood there in stunned silence for all of a minute, but unfortunately for Mr. Evers, his warning didn't make them scurry out of the library and back to school. No, it only raised more questions from the boys. And after some more prodding and pleading and using their famous Whitman charm to the height of its powers, the librarian cracked. In short, Evers told them a version of the story like my grandma had told me. How Mr. Wilson, the local farmer, was taken in the night many, many years ago and hanged off the Kootenai County Bridge by some kids and their angry daddies. But Evers added one missing detail about the moments after they hanged the old goat farmer, which I'd never heard before. Evers told the twins that when those boys turned around to see Mr. Wilson's body hanging there, all they saw was an empty slack of rope. Which was strange, unsettling, enough to make at least some of that mob wish they hadn't let their vicious, bigoted dispositions get the best of them. Some of them even swore they heard the loud bleeding of a goat as they hightailed it out of there, but dismissed it from their minds. In the days that followed, though, the town realized something was very wrong. Livestock started going missing, only to turn up butchered beyond recognition. Same thing started happening to the town's pets, dogs especially. Missing, then found maimed. Pretty soon, the town's folks were theorizing that when Mr. Wilson vanished from the rope that night, he'd somehow become some monstrous combination of his own furious soul and the goats he dedicated his life to that he'd become, well, you can guess. And before too long, people started going missing, some of whom were the bastards who had attacked Mr. Wilson that night, but some weren't. Only thing they all had in common, they were last seen at night near the Kootenai County Bridge, Mr. Wilson's unmarked grave, where the boys had left Petey all alone. The twins biked away from the library in silence, mulling over Mr. Evers' tale. It scared them. If the goat man was real, they had the answer to Petey's fate. So instead of heading to school like they certainly should have done, Skip and Jack took a different route, to the bridge. It was still light. Maybe they could figure out what happened. And to that end, the trip was a success. As they pulled onto the bridge, they heard something, a dripping sound. It was coming from under their feet, under the bridge. Skip and Jack dismounted and went to peer over the side, but it would have been better for everyone if they hadn't, because there, suspended by a frayed rope wrapped around his chest, was a body, or what remained of one. The head, you see, was gone. 
and loose ribbons of shredded skin peeled off it in other places, sending droplets of semi-clotted blood down to the water below with a steady drip, drip, drip. Even in this state, the Whippins knew they'd found it. What was left of Petey Howell. Skip and Jack didn't have to discuss what to do next. Instinctively, they booked it, pedaling furiously away from the bridge and not stopping for a damn second till they were home. They threw their bikes in the yard, sprinted across their threshold, and slammed the door behind them. Winded, they sat on their beds until the fire in their lungs died down, the horror of what they'd just seen washing over them, as well as what it meant, that the goddamn goat man was real. Now, there were a few things that Skip and Jack should have done here. Mainly, tell the police they'd found Petey, or at least tell their dad, or even just stay home and try to forget about it. But see, once the shock wore off, they found themselves absolutely debilitated by guilt. Skip especially. He knew it was his prank that had wrought this. They left Petey there to die, just because he didn't look up at them one time. So yeah, they were terrified, but also ashamed. There was nothing the Whitman twins hated more than feeling bad about themselves. Frankly, it pissed them off. Skip jumped up as a wave of determination hit him. They couldn't just sit here, letting the goat man rip apart whoever he wanted, he declared. The only way he could atone for their prank on Petey was to... Skip couldn't even finish. He was getting too riled up, too self-righteous. Jack nodded along vigorously. His brother was right. And even if he wasn't, Jack knew he'd go with Skip to the ends of the earth if that's what he asked for. So Jack stood, looked Skip dead in the eye, and finished his brother's thought. Let's kill the goat man. Skip and Jack waited until nightfall until their dad was asleep, and then grabbed two of his shotguns off the wall and the keys to his truck, again. They also grabbed their dog, named Killer, and set off. They turned their lights off as they approached the bridge, so as not to forego the element of surprise, letting the silvery, moonlit trees along the road guide them down. And look, not to jump too far ahead or anything, but if there is a next life, then that's a decision the pair will be sitting around roaring for close to eternity. See, there's another small detail Mr. Evers, and my grandma for that matter, had left out of the story a small but crucial detail, which is, when those town folk came for Mr. Wilson in the night all those years ago, they came with their lights off in order to sneak up on him. And as a result, that's what really sets the goat man off. That's the thing that drives him to murder the innocent. Not revenge, but blind rage from people moving over his grave in the dark, reminding him of that night. Which means for all the terror and fury, the goat man is actually surprisingly easy to avoid. It's how the town, their dad included, had managed to exist calmly enough for years with a known monster lurking nearby. Because just that small precaution, a light, kept him at bay. But without it, well, it's why Petey had ended up ripped to shreds earlier. And it's what set the stage for what was about to come that night with the twins. Anyway, the boys parked the truck at the edge of the bridge and sat there, staring out the windshield. The whole place looked eerier, more forbidden than it had just a few days earlier, before they knew about the bridge's history. Funny how that happens. Finally, Skip said, Go tie Killer's leash to the railing. Jack was staring at the distant bloodstained puddles, the freshest one from Petey, and the one next to it from that headless dog, and then others, which he just now realized weren't oil stains like he'd always assumed. His grip on the gun slipped into his clammy palms and he felt his resolve dwindle. He looked to Skip for encouragement and got a small smile in return, but Jack could tell. His brother was scared too. Jack climbed out and trip-trapped out to the middle of the bridge with Killer. The dog, the bait, whimpered as Jack tied it to the railing. Don't worry, he said trying to sound as reassuring as possible. I'll be back real soon. The plan was simple. To run back and hide in the tree line, guns drawn, ready for the goat man to emerge to feast on another innocent pup. But first, 
which I couldn't help peering over the side to check on Petey. And yep, he was still hanging there, still very much dead. Jack winced and silently promised his classmate that they'd get him out of there as soon as they took care of business. Then he heard the scream from under his feet, from beneath the bridge. It wasn't the scream of a man or an animal. It was a beast. Skip and Jack froze. Skip by the car and Jack on the bridge, eyes wide and staring back at his brother, kind of hunched over. In fact, that's how Jack remained for the rest of his life, which wasn't a whole lot longer. Because he never saw what Skip saw, the dark figure that leapt up from beneath the bridge, high in the air, landing behind him. He never saw the silhouette of a massive creature, maybe 10, 15 feet tall, towering over him. He never saw, when it stepped into the moonlight, that this creature wasn't human. Or its body was, but the head was too large, too wide, with a snout and horns, a goat's head. He never saw what was, of course, the goat man. Because even though he had a weapon, Jack was simply unable to move, to breathe, to think. And before he had a chance to run or scream, before he even had a chance to turn around, the horns of Goatman came down, plunging deep into Jack's flesh. Tearing, sucking, gnashing, ripping vital organs until the boy was flung like a rag doll over the side of the bridge. Skip, however, he saw all this. He could have run then. He could have hidden. He could have taken aim with a shotgun. Who the hell knows if any of that would have been successful or not, but he could have tried. Except it turns out that watching your twin brother get ripped apart by a half-man, half-goat behemoth is a debilitating sight. Knowing the reason he was ripped apart was paralyzing too, because this was all his fault. Again, his idea to come and catch the goat man like it was his idea to wreak havoc on Petey's life, just because he felt threatened. Isn't that how this creature was made in the first place? Just like those men who'd hung poor old Mr. Wilson, who thereby created the goat man. Skip was certain that he'd earned some kind of comeuppance. So he didn't run. He knew what was coming, what he deserved, and simply waited his turn. And as those loud clomping steps got closer, Skip looked up to the full moon above, the last thing he'd ever witnessed on this mortal coil before the goat man was on him. Now what happened to the Whitman twins in those woods? That's just legend. Sure, the town librarian apparently once muttered years later something about how he'd warned the twins to steer clear, etc., etc., which I guess counts as some sort of evidence. But all I know for sure is that they, like Petey Howell, were never seen or heard from again. And truthfully, my hometown wasn't the same without them, swaggering around like they owned the place. Their daddy, of course, wasn't the same either. That's a whole nother sad story. I still think about them a lot, though. I think about the goat man, too. Not just the horror of it, though that's scary enough. A true monster. Head of a goat and the smarts of a man, with horns ready to rip you open from head to toe. But I don't stay up at night thinking about that, about the creature itself. I'm more bothered about how it got there. See... The story of Mr. Wilson is about a group of folks who didn't think he deserved success because of the color of his skin, pure and simple. And thinking you're better than someone else and punishing them for it? Well, that's also an everybody problem. That kind of jealousy, it can come from your neighbors, your loved ones, hell, it can come from yourself. And though headlights and sodium lamps and what have you might keep away the goat man, it'll do nothing for the problem that made him. And that, my friends, is just as important to watch out for as the lethal monster that stalks the woods of Prince George's County.